bunch to have sing before I preach, amen. Yeah. Jimmy, that's like having uh, Faye and your girl singing before you preach. It'd just make it a little easier, wouldn't it? Amen. And Jim, that tweet would sing before you'd preach. Reckon anybody would stay to hear you preach? Yes. <laughs> amen. Amen. What's well, good to be in the Lord's house tonight? Um, it's been a uh, um, tumultuous couple of weeks. It seems like uh, uh, the news is just full of stories that grab your attention and, and get your mind to wondering about the, uh, the times that we live in. I've said it a bunch. I think we're living in the last days, and uh, with the events that go on in this world, it just kind of justifies it, and you see the things going on, and you understand that, man, you know, we're getting close to the end. And then today, as Tommy mentioned earlier, we hear the news of the passing of uh, Billy Graham. Uh, he just turned 99. This is in his 100th year. And, and while I can't uh, elevate Billy Graham because we can't boast in the flesh, I, I can say that he did a tremendous work uh, for the Lord and Savior. Now, he fell into, there's some people, some like him, some don't like him, and I'm not here to argue one way or another, but um, I did hear, I heard several of his messages when he would preach crusades around the world. It said he preached over 200 million people. That's more than I'll probably ever get to preach to. Um, but uh, they said millions upon millions were saved, not because of him, but the gospel message that he presented. And the world's going to miss that, uh, going to miss him, and I think God has uh, uh, got a gap to fill. And uh, that task, that torch, if you will, it gets passed on. I think when Paul died, it was passed on to Timothy. It was passed to Titus and, and those that he had raised in the faith and taught the ways of Christ and taught the gospel to take that torch, if you will, and, and carry on to the next generation, to the next group. And uh, God saw, I guess, Billy's time was up, but you and I are still here tonight, and we know this, that there is lots of work yet to be done concerning the gospel. As many people as he was able to reach through the doors God opened for him, there are many, many, probably millions more that still need to hear it. Now who's tasked with that? Go to Psalms chapter 94. Psalms chapter 94. Have you ever thought that watching a road construction crew would teach you about the gospel? Anybody ever driven by a group of, uh, we'll, we'll call them fellas, I've seen some ladies out there in recent years, but uh, a group, of, they call them the road departments, you know, they'll all be working on a project, they'll be paving or patching or doing something and, on the road, and usually the way it works is you'll drive by them and you'll see about 30 of them, and you'll see about three that's really just putting it down, shovel to hand and just working, and the rest of them are either leaning on their shovel or taste testing the coffee. And watching the other ones work, I went by one, and there was a poor old fellow down in a ditch. I mean, mud everywhere all over him. He was slinging stuff everywhere out of that hole. The <laughs> rest of them was up there just clean, just kind of pointing where he ought to throw uh, the next barrel of mud. And when I think of men like uh, Billy Graham and the apostles and the disciples of old and the preachers, those that have gone on before us, I can't help but see that same picture. It's real easy to stand and watch someone else who seems to have an ability do a work like that. And then we stand back and say, well, who am I to stop them? They're doing a great work. I'll just be supportive of them. You know, you can do it. That a boy. And uh, it's time, though, for us to, and I'm not saying anybody here does this. I know at times I'll do it. Uh, sometimes it's easier when two people are somewhere and one of them starts talking about the Lord. You just be quiet and listen, you know. Hey, have at it. You know, I was nervous about it anyway. But God needs some people. And events like today, when we lose someone who had such an influence for Christ, days like this and events like what happened at the school in Florida, tell us something. In Psalms 94, I want to preach to you tonight on who will stand up. Who will stand up. Psalms 94, verses 14 through 18 is where we'll take our text tonight. And God asked this very question. And uh, he's talking to his people who had fallen into sin. They had fallen under judgment. And I believe that uh, from time to time, we fall under the judging hand of God due to our sins. But I want you to see this. Psalms 94, verse 14. If you've got it, say amen. amen. The Bible says, For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. But judgment shall return unto righteousness, and all the upright in heart shall follow it. 
Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Or who will stand up for me, uh, for me against the workers of iniquity? Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. When I said, My foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. Father, we stand now in your presence uh, in great need this hour. And, and Father, we uh, not only need your help with our issues, our problems, and our prayer requests, but we need your help to be in this world now and to live for you. And, and God, to, to do as this text shares tonight and to stand in, a, in an hour of great need that others might see Jesus high and lifted up through us. And God, I pray that you'll bless the reading of your word. I pray, God, that you'll open our hearts and our ears that we may hear what you have to say. And God, help us to be obedient. Help us to hear what you have to say. Now, Father, we love you. We thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You be seated. Thank you for standing with me. I've been a part of some of those crews like that when you get several people doing one task and somebody just, you know, there's always that one person who is a, the hardest worker of the bunch. They take initiative. They'll grab the hammer, they'll grab the shovel or the saw or, or whatever's going on and they'll start to it. And I guess the right thing to do is jump in there with them, but sometimes you just kind of stand back and say, well, you know, if you want to do it, go ahead. <laughs> you know, and, and from time to time we'll kind of lean in and ask, well, if you're getting tired, I'll take over. Boy, my back's kind of stiff, you know. Well, you're doing a good job. I just don't think I can swing that thing like that. Uh, but if you need anything holler, I'll see what I can do. You know, <laughs> you know, we got no intentions on really doing it, but we're trying to encourage him. Hey, hey, keep on going, buddy. Keep on going. And uh, it's easy to do that when it comes to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we hear others or we see others who um, are doing a great job of, of witnessing for the Lord or sharing the gospel or they're living a great example. That's one of the things that's impressive about uh, Mr. Graham's life is that he, for the most part, uh, stood faultless before the media. They couldn't find that moral issue, that, that big scandal, that affair, that corruption that so many televangelists and preachers today fall into. And I know that was him relying on God for everything. I don't think that was anything he accomplished on his own. I think he had faith in, in God and followed Christ, and I think that's what uh, kept that for him. But, you know, going back and you look at that, and it's easy to look at folks like that and just kind of take a step back and, and say, well, I, I know I'm supposed to share the gospel. I know I'm supposed to do this or that, but, you know, so-and-so's doing it, and I'll just pray for them. I'll just encourage them. Now, we need to do that. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. But God is looking for people, I believe, right now, today, to stand up for him. And I believe it's because verse 14, look at this again. Verse 14 says, The Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. Uh, God got mad. God, do you believe God gets angry? Uh, God does. God gets angry. You have two factions of people. Some believe God's an angry God that wants to kill everybody. And you've got some that believe God never gets mad at anything. Well, those are two extremes. And God is, of course, neither completely one or the other. God is pleased with his people sometimes. And there are times when God is angry. And I think we are in a day where we have tried the patience of God and uh, the only thing that's preventing the full judging hand of God is the constraining spirit of the Lord Jesus, uh, or the Holy Spirit rather, and Jesus Christ is sacrificed for us. However, I do still think that from time to time we do see uh, judgments, if you will, of a sort. I won't get into all that tonight, but passed down. We see things happen and we, and we see things and we understand and we have the sense enough to know that God is trying to show us something. God's trying to wake us up. God's trying to say, you are headed for the path of destruction. Now, this is what he's talking about. The Lord will not cast off his people. Yes, he will punish his children. But notice he says, he will not forsake his inheritance. That's you and me. Now, but judgment, it says, shall return unto righteousness. He's saying judgment will turn, and the upright in heart will follow it. You see, when God is, when the righteousness of God is put forth and the righteousness of Christ is put forth. Those who are upright in heart say, I want to be like that. I want to be like Jesus. I want to learn about Jesus. I want to, I want to learn more about God. I want to follow Him. How many people you hear today say things like that? Very few. Very few. Um, I, I was going to preach tonight on another gospel. Uh, the title would have been another gospel, but the Lord brought me here. But it seems like today that... Um, we're so worried about ourselves that we're not worried any longer about God. We kind of tend to think, well, I've got to take care of myself and what God wants done, he'll get done. Because we've heard it said, well, if, if so-and-so don't do it, God will use somebody else to do it. 
I think that's true, but that doesn't excuse us. You know, that doesn't excuse us from not doing anything. That's kind of the way it is on the road cruise. You got to have a, a hole dug, and, and you're the closest one to the hole. And, hey, you look like you want to dig a hole today. You know, uh, I'm not trying to get my boots dirty. I don't want people to think I work. You know, <laughs> for a but we kind of look around and who who's going to do this? And, and that's not the way it is. We that are saved. We that are born again should desire to learn, desire to be closer, desire to uh, have uh, those righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, to learn about that, to seek after it. But sometimes we don't. And we live in a world where we need folks. God needs people. God needs churches who will stand for him. Not stand for us. Okay, that's a lot of that going on today. People stand not for God, but they stand for the people. How to make our lives better. You wouldn't believe the messages I hear from people that are, I, I consider friends. And they just are in, enamored with preachers today who only preach on how good God can make your life. You know? And that seems to be an overwhelming uh, theme in the world today. We're not too much worried about what God wants. It's more about what we want. You know? How can God help me achieve what I want to do? Not how can I help God achieve what he wants to do. But that's what he's saying here. He says, uh, he will not cast it off, but he says, judgment shall return, and the upright in heart shall follow it. Now, if we're going to stand, and I want to, do you want to? I want this church to. I want this church to be that city that's set on a hill. I want this church to be a place that God can send sinners, don't you? I want this church to be a place where God can send the lost and that they'll learn about Christ and that they'll come to be saved. Not because I'm the pastor, not because you're here but because Jesus is put to the forefront. It's not about us, it's about Him. The purpose of the church gathering is not for me to tell you how much you can get blessed if you do certain things. It's to lift up Jesus, and the more we cast our eyes on Him, the better off we're all going to be. Okay? Now, but we need to stand, and I want this church to do that. I want you to do that out in this world. Because when something like this happens, uh, when we have somebody who is a religious figure like uh, Brother Graham die, Many people, even though they may not be religious, start to wonder, you know, well, boy, he, you know, he's, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, the, some people who fuss about God, all of a sudden when stuff like this happens, they'll kind of find a, a curiosity of God, or, or what made this guy live 80 years of his life for the gospel? What, what about this guy was so special? No doubt as the news wears on, there's going to be atheists, there's going to be people who wander in their minds, and I think that's God's way. God can work through anything. He's going to work and have them start to thinking about things. Have them maybe stirring their heart up, okay? But he's not the one that's around to live that gospel. It's you and me. And there's people you know, there's people I know, there's people we encounter all the time that need us to stand, to stand up, to, to step out, if you will. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, look in verse 16. Let me give you three thoughts here tonight, best I can see them here from our text. We're going to start them all with E tonight, help them easy to remember. Verse 16, the first part, I want you to see this. If we're going to stand, we must engage. Engage. Verse 16 says, Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? What does that mean? If we're going to stand for God, we've got to be willing to engage this world. Not to stand back, okay, and let things go on without voice. Not to step back and hope somebody else says something about this. Not to step back and say, well, you do the best you can, and, and if it all works out in the end, we're all going to heaven. That's still a popular teaching, by the way. If you do real good, you'll get to go to heaven. You know? Well, the fact of it is, friend, that's just not true. What, do we, what does God want? He wants people to stand up. What does he need them to do? He needs them to engage this culture. Talk to them. Put yourself out there. And when you hear those things, say something. When you hear somebody say, Lord, I just hope at the end my good outweighs my bad and I get to heaven. Say something. Engage them. That could not be a more perfect opportunity to say, would you like to know how to be sure? <laughs> well, you, you don't sound like you're very sure, but I'm sure. If I die tonight, I know I'm going to go to God. What is it about, what is it about you that you're not sure? Man, that's tailor-made. That's Taylor made to step right in. Things like that happen all the time. Engage. Engage. When you hear somebody uh, saying stuff about God or the Bible, say something. Okay? Now, what if that means that somebody gets mad at me? 
Well, you're in good company because Jesus got mad. They got mad at him too. And Jesus even said, look, if they're mad at you, they're really mad at me. You see, they're not mad at you. They're mad at what you said. You know how I can prove it? You go out tonight to the Walmart. You go out and talk about Tennessee football, which is disgusting, by the way. Jim almost made me sick till I seen Jesus on his shirt. And it kind of balanced out the it balanced out the the, the way. But you go to Walmart tonight and you bring that up and you talk about how good a year they're going to have, and you're going to find people who will talk to you for an hour or hours about that. But then you walk up that same person and say, "Can we talk about God?" <laughs> the conversation's probably going to go differently. Sometimes it may not if you meet a fellow brother or sister in Christ. But it's not going to be the same thing. And that keeps us from engaging because we feel that we're inconveniencing them. We feel that we're bothering them. Friend, listen, if we don't bother them, Satan's going to bother them for eternity in the flames of hell. I'm not too worried about bothering them in light of that. You know, We've got to get past these things that say, well, you know, God don't want us to disrupt things or God don't want us to do this or that. Friend, listen. The devil's got us so fooled we're missing all this stuff. Listen, we've got to engage. If we're going to stand, we've got to engage and say, look, it's all about Jesus. That's what I think makes a church different than another church. And it's where we live and you've got this modern gospel, this modern movement of church, and it's very different than what we do here. Now, some people say, well, we're old-fashioned, we need to change. And some say, well, they're too way out there in left field, they need to change. And and, the, and you go back and forth on all that and what do you do? Do you just step back and say well everybody do what they want to do well I'll worship God the same way that's real close to saying you do what you want to do well I'll go to heaven the same way it's not a real big step now it's different, mind you, it's different but you see what I'm saying if we just step back and let people believe everything they want to believe about God everything they want to believe about Christ everything they want to believe about everything are we really doing what we've been called to do? now my job is not to go out and change the church their church. My job is not to stand and preach against another faith or religion. My job is to preach the truth of the Word of God. Now, if the truth of that Word of God contradicts with another church, I am not apologizing for that. I'm not going to stand up here and say, today the sermon is going to be on why the Methodist church is wrong. <laughs> that's terrible. Okay, Dude, That's not of God. That's not gospel. However, when I preach from this book, if it contradicts something that they're teaching, I'm not apologizing for that. If it contradicts something that is error somewhere else, we must still say it. Do you understand? And now we've gotten to the place now where Jesus is so controversial, we just stop preaching him. You know, the blood, nobody likes to hear about blood, so let's leave that out. Well, some people believe baptized, some people believe don't, so let's leave that out. But what you got left? You're preaching the index, a table of contents, if you will. Engage, get out there for Jesus. Individually and as a church, we've got to engage. Now secondly, look at this, verse 16 again. Who will rise up for me against these evildoers? Or, notice this, who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Not only must we engage, but we must endure. And I'll tell you what, the attacks of the devil will absolutely wear you Ephesians chapter 6, Paul was giving the armor of God. You know, he was telling us to put on the breastplate, put on the helmet, put on, shod our feet, you know, take the sword. A part of that he says, and having done all to stand, stand. Having done everything you can do to stand, that's what God's wanting, stand. What's he talking about? Endurance. Endurance. In Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about the feet being shod. And the idea there goes back to the, the armor of that day. And the armor of that day, they wore on their feet something similar to what we wear in sports today called cleats. And if you've ever seen cleats, they have plastic or metal spikes that come from the bottom to help you gain traction. The soldier in that day would wear an apparatus on his feet that had sometimes nails or some iron spike of some sort coming from the bottom of his feet. The reason for that was if they were fighting on a hill, they could keep a firm grip. Imagine fighting for your life in hand-to-hand -hand combat and you're slipping on the grass <laughs> or in the mud. That's scary. Uh, you're not going to have an advantage that way. So they did that to have a sure footing. Okay, That's what this is all about. Get a sure footing and endure. Stand. Stay in the fight. Engage and endure. Who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? I'll tell you this. If you're going to stand for the Lord, you're going to come under attack. Can I just put that out there for you? 
I wish I could, you know, sugarcoat it and say, if you stand up for the Lord, the Lord's going to protect you and he's going to blow all the enemies off the side of a cliff, you know. Nobody will say anything bad about you. If they do, they'll lose all their hair, you know. It'd be like Elisha. Them kids made fun of him and the bear come down. You know? That's the way it's going to be. You know, if you stand up for God, you won't even have indigestion. We'll have to eat those tacos tomorrow. Boy, you, should, you stand up for God, he's going to take care of it all. God will take care of you. But rest assured, when you stand up for God in any shape, form, or fashion, hell's on its way to you. Hell's on its way. I told somebody one time, I forget what year it was that I'd been here pastoring, but we baptized almost 20 people. You remember that year? It was a good year. You know? And it came into me one time. We were getting ready to go out to the camp, you know, to baptize. And it's just as if God kind of showed me a picture of something. That when you do things like that, when a church does things like that, when you go out and you do anything for God, there's an alarm or a gong, if you will, that sounds through the corridors of hell. It says, hey, we've got to do something about this. You see, Satan's not worried about the ones on the sidelines. He's not worried about the ones leaning on the shovel watching everybody else dig. He's worried about the one that's digging. He's worried about the one that's getting his hands dirty. He's worried about the one that's actually getting something done. That needs to be me. And that needs to be you. How ah, but we got to endure. Listen to me, I'll tell you, your family will turn on you. I'm going to be as real as I can be. If I'm lying, boys, you call me out. Your family going to turn on you. Your friends is going to turn on you. And God knows what else may happen. I'm trying to put it as plain as I can put it for you. It's not going to be a bed of roses. Okay? When I turned back to Christ, I lost every friend I had. You can ask Brandy. We had a bunch of us. We ran around together through high school. I thought we'd be best buddies all my life until I started back to church. And they all didn't like that. And they still don't like it. I see them today. They still go the other way. I lost my friends. And boy, to me, you know, it, you know, in your 20s, early 20s, you socialize everything, you know. It's hard to walk into Walmart, see your best friend's wife, turn and go down another aisle when she sees you. That's hard. But it's the way it is. It's all because of church to them. But really it was Jesus what it was. But you see, you've got to endure those things. You've got to endure those things because the easy thing to do is like, man, if it's going to cost me this, that's a price I'm not willing to pay. Friend, listen, I've got more friends now than I ever dreamed I'd have. Now, I'm not the best friend of them, but they're still sweet to me, so I guess I can count them as friends. I don't know. I've got more friends now than I've ever had. I've got a friend that's sticking closer than a brother to beat it up. Endure. Because what you temporarily go through here is nothing, the Bible says, to be compared with the glory that waits over yonder. No man's lost mother, daughter, or son. Job thought he lost everything. God said, oh yeah, watch this. He gave it all back. I'm seven. Multiples of it. Endure. When you, do a, when you take a stand for God, be ready. Okay, your water heater's going to bust. Your car's going to break down. You name it, if it aggravates you, it's going to happen. <laughs> sometimes it's oppression. Sometimes it's just the way things are. Just timing is what it is. But if we're not careful, we'll walk away. If I, and I've said this before. I don't mean this way it's fixed to sound. But if I had a nickel for every person who's came to an altar of a church I've been in and said, I've given my life back to the Lord. I'm going to serve him. Oh, I'm so excited to serve God. And I've never seen him again. If all those people were still at this church, we'd have two of these churches full tonight. What happens? No endurance. No endurance. The Bible talks about that. I ain't got time to preach on it tonight. But we must endure if we're going to stay in church. Listen, we're going to have to endure too. Do you realize the amount of people who have told me how to make this church bigger? They mean well. But everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's also got other things. Noses. That don't mean you're right. Oh, but they, yeah, I'll tell you how you grow your Sunday school. Here's what you do. i tell you how you get your worship attendance up. I've got a friend tonight that I consider him a friend. If he called me and not need help, I'd help him. Most, a lot of people in here know him. I love the fellow. Every time I have any time with him, he's always telling me what I need to do to make the church bigger. He means well, but just to be completely honest, it's not the way I feel led to do things. Not that I'm right, but I try to follow God, okay? What do you have to do? You have to endure that stuff because when you see, as a pastor, when you see somebody else's church with seven, eight hundred thousand people, and you're pastoring a smaller church, up there, 
what are you doing I'm not, you know? Man, I'd like to preach to a thousand people. They may not like to hear it, but I'd like to preach to a thousand people. Well, here's how you do it. You know how tempting that is? Endurance. Endurance. When you take a stand for God and somebody comes at you critically or with the tongue and hurts you or turns their back on you or looks at you funny or says, don't bother me with that stuff. That's all you're going to talk about. Just take that some. When they come to you with that, listen, you have got to endure. You have got to endure. He said in verse 16, who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Those that are continually working, who's going to stand and take that? Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about the shield of faith. You see that shield in those days, one of the popular forms of warfare was archery. Y'all ever seen those old movies where those archers will light those arrows and they'll lean back a few hundred and they'll launch those arrows at an arch, you know, onto an incoming regiment. Well, what they learned to do is they would take these shields and they, these shields would be the length of a of a soldier, six feet or so. And what they would do, these shields are made out of wood. You hit a flaming arrow on a wooden shield, it's going to burn. What they did, they would take leather, soak the leather in water and other things, and then they would attach the leather to the outside of the shield, wet it again before they went into battle. That arrow hits the shield, it puts the arrow out. That's what the word says, to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. That's endurance. That's taking hell's best shot and keeping on going. That's taking the best the devil can throw at you, taking the best they can do, the best hook they can throw, the best kick they can kick, and say, I'm going to keep going. You're not going to stop me. I'm not going to quit. God said, that's what I need. Those who will engage, those who will endure. Lastly, verse 17, those who will expect. Expect what? Well, don't expect to go through this by yourself. Let me show you this. Verse 17, unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. Talking about hell. Had it not been for the Lord, he said, I would have died. And I would have died in silence. Without God, I would have suffered. But God was there. Listen, if you'll stand for God, okay, you're going to have to engage. You're going to have to endure. But you can also expect this. He's going to go with you. He's going to walk with you every step of the way. And when something happens that hurts you, he sees it. Nobody else may know it. Nobody else may understand it. He does. And let me tell you something. He is not the one you want to make angry. One day he will destroy this world. But that God that can do that is a God that walks with you. Now God's not going to smite people down. But he will help us. That's what David said. The Lord had been my help. Support. Literally this idea. Holding him up. done funerals of mothers who have lost children. By the way, I've done a lot more than I ever wanted to do. But it's a pitiful thing. When you know how the you know the night of the viewing, the family gets to go in first. And they want the preacher there to go in with them, you know. There's some sounds you just never forget. One sound that I'll never forget, I'll never, is the sound of a mother who sees the child in the coffin. It's a sound that is, uh, and when you're trying to help them and they collapse, okay, when you're holding them off the ground, God, that's hard to hear. But that's what Jesus will do for us when we are collapsing under it all, when we are suffering like we've never suffered, when it hurts worse than it's ever hurt, when we're falling down, Jesus will hold us up. He will hold us and love us and say, I'm here. I know it's hard. I know it's been tough. I know the road's long. I know they're being mean to you. I know it's not working out. I know life's hard. I've been there. I've felt it. But I'm going with you. Look, Jesus went to the cross, didn't he? Yeah, he went to heaven, yeah. He's walking this road with us again. Yes, He's done walked his road once. He chose to say, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He walked his road to Calvary and he chose to come walk ours. Think of that for a second. Had I had to walk that road to Calvary, had I had to walk that walk and die that death, I'd say, Lord, it's finished. And he would have been justified to sit there and say, no, I died for you. 
Look, that's all I can do. Y'all are going to have to suck it up. Y'all got to figure this out. I give you a Bible. I give you my blood. I give you everything I can do. The rest of it's on y'all. Y'all have got to do some of this yourself. He loved you so much, he said, you know what? I've done walked that road once, but I'll walk it again for you. Expect that he will be there to help you. Verse 18 says, when my foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. I was up on my roof one time. Uh, I got a tin roof. And anybody that's got a tin roof, if there's any moisture on that thing, you're just asking for it. <laughs> okay? I mean, and uh, I've got a lot of gravitational pull, if you will. So if the angle of my grip is wrong and that grip gives way, uh, meteor's going to strike Cleveland. You know? <laughs> the weather service will say, what was that landing in Cleveland? That's brother, that's preacher Mason. He's all right. I was up on my roof. I don't remember what I was doing. I think I was trying to clean them good. Don't you hate cleaning gutters out? They better not be no gutters on my match. I'll tell the Lord to take them off. Clean those gutters. And, and I'm moving them around, you know, and it happens. Y'all know that any of you fellas ever had that feeling? Ladies, you ever been on a roof and had it? When your feet, when, when your shoes, the grip gives out? And here you go. <laughs> Man, that's a, that's a bad feeling. In your mind, you're trying to think real quick. What can I grab? What can I hold on to? How far down is this? Can I, I mean, you know it's just, you know it. You're in trouble. And uh, I slid. And as I was headed down to the gutters, and I kind of already knew the gutters, what, <laughs> they're not going to stop me. <laughs> I'm going on, you know. I'm already thinking, well, I'll scream loud enough for Brandon to come get me, you know. But as I'm going just about to the edge, there's a row of screws. You know how you screw 10 on. And my foot caught the screw. And it stopped me. And I thank God for the screws. Amen. <laughs> you see, that's what Jesus is. As we're walking this thing, folks, look, we've got to walk up some hills. We're going to have to walk down some valleys. And when we walk, sometimes we're going to slip. What do I mean by that? We're going to sin. Okay? We're going to mess up. We're going to slip. But when we do, he'll help us. Kind of like Peter. Peter slipped, didn't he? Peter got walking out through the water and slipped. There he goes. You know. Jesus reached out. He held him up. What did he hold him up with? Mercy. Justice would have said, Peter, y'all know better. <laughs> you idiot. You climb out of a boat thinking you're going to walk on water. Peter, what's wrong with you? You deserve to sink. Or maybe. Peter, you got out the boat. Good for you. Hey, you was walking on water. Nobody else ever done that but me. Congratulations. But what in the world made you think you could lose your focus on me and keep doing that? What made you think, Peter, you could just look around whatever else is going on and still walk with me? Peter, you all know better than that. Swim for sure, Peter. You're on your own. We'd have done that. But Jesus reached down, grabbed him up, walked him back to the boat. As far as we can tell, didn't scold him at all. And he just stood up and he calmed the storm. When I said, my foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. Engage, okay, endure, but expect that he'll be there. Because he will. I'll tell you how long he'll be there. He'll be there when I take my last breath. I don't know how long I'm going to live. I'll live long and Jesus wants me to live, I reckon. But when it comes my time, I know he'll be there. I know he will. I might go at home. I might go on a hospital. I might go on a plane. I don't know. But he'll be there. He'll take me home. You see, there's something special about salvation. I'll never be by myself ever again. He'll walk with me this whole journey. He'll walk with me when I die and cross Jordan. He'll walk with me on the streets of home. I'll never again, for all of eternity, be without Jesus. I'm just getting closer every day. Isn't that wonderful? Let's go, church. Stand up. Stand up. This world needs you. Family needs you. This church needs you. The people that drive by this church, and you wouldn't believe the people that say, well, we just saw that church. We figured we'd like to come visit. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that was their thought process? Can I tell you what happened? God said, you go there. God said, why don't you go up there? Why? Because something here was something God could use. And what I hope that is, is that we'll stand for him. It's not about me. It's not about y'all. Not about our singing deacons as good as they are. It's about him. Let's stand together all around the church tonight.